For decades, Palestinians have been deprived from the right of telling their own story of what really happened to them. For decades, the Israeli narrative dominated the world media. And for decades, nobody knew really what was happening in Palestine. This is our story, a story of Palestinian people who have been aspiring since the beginning of the previous century to freedom, liberty, justice, peace, and equality. This is a story of what really happened in Palestine. Back in the beginning of the 20th century, Palestinians were struggling to have independence and freedom. They were hoping to have a state that is democratic, where Palestinians and Jewish people would live side by side in equality and with equal democratic rights. But we were told by the international community that this could not be the solution. And the same international community decided in 1947 to create the two-state solution. Contrary to what many people think, the two-state solution is not new. It goes back to 1947 when the United Nations General Assembly decided to divide Palestine into two states. One state in the white area would become Israel with almost 55% of the land, and the Palestinian state in the green area with about 45% of the land. Unfortunately, this never materialized. At the time when the United Nations issued its resolution, Palestinians owned 93% of the land, and they represented 70% of the total population. Regardless of these facts, 55% of the land was allocated to Israel, and only 45% was allocated to the Palestinian state. Israel was established, but not on 55%, but rather on 78% of the land of historic Palestine. And what remained was only the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem, with less than 22% of the land. Palestinians were deprived by many forces from forming their own state. And in 1988, they decided to accept a very painful compromise, to give up the dream of one state solution and accept a two state solution where they would accept to have a tiny little state in the West Bank, Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem on less than half of what they should have had as a state according to the same UN resolution that gave Israel its legitimacy. And that was the basis of signing the Oslo Agreement. But to the greatest surprise of the Palestinian leadership, in 1999 when they got to Camp David, the offer they got from the Israelis with American sponsorship was this map. A state without borders, a state without their capital, East Jerusalem, and a state without almost 80% of the water resources, which would be enclaved and controlled by Israeli settlements, which would take away more than 4% of what should have become the Palestinian state. And as if this was not enough, Sharon and later Netanyahu went further by cutting off more land from what should be the Palestinian state, transforming the whole idea from a Palestinian state that could be sovereign, contiguous, and viable into nothing but clusters of pantostans, ghettos, that can never form a real state. So this is the real story of the Palestinians, a state that was reduced from 45% in 1947 to 22% in 1967, which Palestinians accepted to have as a state, who less than 18%, which was offered by Barak, and now down to 11% of separated areas that become like ghettos and pantostans. This did not happen as an accident. It happened according to a plan, and that plan was developed by Gal Alon, the foreign minister of Israel, in 1967. He developed a plan to deal with the fact that 
After the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza and Jerusalem, the Palestinians never left. They did not repeat what happened in 1948 when 800,000 Palestinians out of one million who were living at the land at that time were forced to leave their country. This time, Palestinians decided we will die in our land and never leave. And that created the so-called the demographic problem. The Israeli solution to the demographic problem was not to accept the concept of ending occupation, which would have led to peace, but rather develop this plan of Egal alone, which included the creation of big number of settlements around Jerusalem area, the creation of many settlements in the Jordan Valley, and then more settlements in the north and the south with one aim, killing the possibility of a contiguous state and segmenting and fragmenting Palestinian populated areas into clusters of ghettos. This happened gradually. First, Israel built the settlements. You can see all these spots that represent settlements. Later, claiming this was needed because of security, they initiated checkpoints. More than 700 military checkpoints that stop and prevent freedom of movement in Palestinian territory. We have put on the map only half of the checkpoints because if we put them all, you will see a completely red map. These checkpoints destroyed the contiguity of geography, destroyed social systems, destroyed health and educational systems. For example, a person who would travel from Jenin to Ramallah would usually need an hour and 20 minutes to get there. Because of the checkpoints, this distance could take about seven hours and sometimes more. These checkpoints were part of a system which was later completed with the development of the apartheid wall. A wall that was built in the north, in the center, and in the south. And in 85% of the time, this wall was built not on the borders between West Bank and Israel, but it was built inside the West Bank to annex as much as possible of the Palestinian land and creating separation not between Palestinians and Israelis, but rather separation between Palestinians and Palestinians. This whole system, including settlements, checkpoints, the wall, and then later segregation of roads, as well as unjust laws and military orders, were all part of a matrix the aim of which was to change the nature of the Palestinian territory from Palestinian land with Israeli settlements as foreign bodies into an Israeli land with Palestinian communities separate from each other and isolated. Later, there is a plan to create even another wall in the eastern side to exclude Jordan Valley from the rest of the West Bank and transforming, as I said, the West Bank into these uh, separate pantostans from each other. The Israelis claim that the wall was built because of security reasons. The truth is that the wall itself was only part of that system and matrix that aimed at land appropriation and confiscation of water resources. The proof to that is very simple. In 1993-94-95, when Oslo Agreement was signed and applied, the Israelis would never accept to give Palestinians more than separate territories and they insisted on keeping more than 60% of the land under their full control, calling it Area C. Regardless of the fact that Oslo Agreement said that by 1999 Israel should have redeployed from more than 90% of the land, Israel kept all these territories under its control. Palestinian presence was in the so-called Area A and B, which you can see on the map here, 
but separated from each other without real contiguity. When the wall was created in 2002, claiming that it was for security reasons, what shocked us most was that when we applied the wall map on the Oslo map, which was created at the time of peace and negotiation, that's what we got, a complete fit from the West and a complete fit from the East, with enclaves that would go deep to incorporate as many settlements as possible, transforming the Palestinian territory into this map, which looks only like Pantostans, separate from each other. The only other map that looks like that was the map of South Africa during the apartheid system. At that time, Africans were forced to live in these Pantostans separated from each other, without any sovereignty over most of the land. And in some of these Pantostans, they had governments. Even in one of them, they had a king. But that meant nothing, because all these Pantostans and all these governments and self-governing authorities were all under the control of the apartheid system, like the situation today is in Palestinian territories, where the Palestinian Authority remains under the control of occupation and the apartheid system it has created. After more than 62 years of dispossession of Palestinian refugees, who represent more than half of the Palestinian people, more than five and a half million Palestinians dispossessed outside the territory of Palestine, all over the world. And after more than 42 years of military occupation of the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem, Israel has developed a system of apartheid. It is very clear in every aspect of daily life. For example, Israel controls today 80% of the water resources of the West Bank and allows Palestinian citizens to use no more than 50 cubic meters per capita per year, while it allows illegal Israeli settlers to use more than 2,400 cubic meters of water per year. 42 times more than the Palestinians. The Israeli GDP per capita averages around $26,000 per year, while the GDP per capita in Palestine is no more than $1,000. Yet, we are obliged, because of imposed market union and tax union, to pay the same prices for goods as Israelis do. More than that, we are obliged to buy our water and electricity from Israel. And we have to pay double the price that Israeli citizens pay. Palestinians have to pay five shekels per unit of water while Israelis pay 2.4. They have to pay 13 shekels per unit of electricity while Israelis pay 6.3. And on top of that, Israel has initiated a system of road segregation. Most of the main roads in the West Bank are exclusive for Israeli settlers or Israeli army. I, like many Palestinians, would be sentenced to six months in jail if we are caught walking or driving on these main roads in the West Bank. There hasn't been ever any similar case in human history where roads would be segregated. Even the, in the, during the worst time of segregation in the United States or during the worst time of apartheid in South Africa, road segregation did not exist. It shows clearly what some of our friends in South Africa have told us, that we cannot even compare the apartheid system in Palestine with that of South Africa because it is much worse than what prevailed in South Africa at one point of time. One of the main structures that resembles apartheid is the apartheid wall that was built inside the occupied territories. It is called in many foreign media outlets a fence. 
A fence is a mild structure that exists between neighbors. But this structure that Israel has built is no fence at all. It's a huge wall that will extend for about 850 kilometers when finished. It is three times as long and twice as high as Berlin Wall used to be. And even when it is not made of concrete wall, it extends to something between 60 and 104 meters, depriving Palestinians from vast areas of land. This wall kills Palestinian life. It destroys connection between them. It deprives students from the possibility of reaching their schools or universities. It deprives hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from the ability to reach medical care or health systems. This is an image of a woman in Bethlehem. Her house is surrounded by the wall from three directions. You can see her in the picture, standing on the roof of her two-floor building. I visited her last Christmas and she told me she cannot go to the roof anymore because the army told her that she needs a military permit to go to the roof of her own house. And when she asked the Israeli officers why is that, they told her because her presence represents a threat to the wall. I was born in Jerusalem. I worked as a medical doctor in Jerusalem for 15 years. And since four years, the Israeli army deprives me from the right of visiting Jerusalem. Not even with a permit. And the road itself that I used to take does not exist anymore because it is already separated into two pieces by the same apartheid wall, which is separating Palestinians on the right side from Palestinians on the left side of the road that you can see in this slide. I once watched a movie, it's called The Pianist. It's a very good movie about the suffering of Jewish people in Warsaw Ghetto during the Second World War. And I sympathized a lot with the suffering of these people. By the way, nothing of what I'm telling you today negates or undermines the suffering of Jewish people, whether in the Holocaust time, or during the pogroms of Russia, or the Inquisition time in Spain. But that suffering of the Jewish people at that time does not justify by any means the suffering of the Palestinian people today. As a matter of fact, those who are oppressing us today are not the same people who suffered at that time. A suffering that we, the Palestinians, had nothing to do with. In a way, as Dr. Edward Said said, we the Palestinians have become the victims of the victims of the Holocaust. And that's why while I was watching that movie, The Pianist, I could not stop myself from thinking about Kalkilia. Kalkilia is a Palestinian city in the north with 46,000 people surrounded by a wall from all directions. It is enclaved completely by this white structure that you can see in the photo. There is only one passage left, a small road that is only eight meters width with a gate. And the gate has a key. And the Israeli soldiers hold the key. And they can shut off the city anytime they want. This is how it looks from the air. You can see the wall surrounding the city. And on the left side, you can see a huge autostrad, a big highway, which is also built on the land of the city of Qalqilia. But people from Qalqilia, like all Palestinians, are not allowed to use this highway. It is exclusive for Israeli citizens and Israeli army. The only thing that changed in this photo was that the Israeli side has painted the wall which overlooks the highway and created structures and planted trees so that the drivers, the Israeli drivers on the highway would not be hurt by the image of this ugly wall. They never thought about the feeling of the people who live 
in Calquilia, which has become like a prison, surrounded by this wall from all directions. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians will be enclaved by the wall. They will be stuck between the wall and the borders with Israel. They cannot move east, they cannot move west. They cannot get to hospitals. They cannot get to schools. They cannot get to their farms. They cannot get to their work. And if they want to move, they are told by the Israeli army that they have to cross only through specific gates. More than 150 of these gates already exist. But they cannot cross the gate unless they have a military permit by the Israeli army, which has to be renewed every few months. But even if they have the permits, they have to follow the times that are assigned for crossing by the Israeli army. And you can see in the picture here one of these signs. It says people can cross only from 7.40 in the morning till 8, from 2 to 2.15 p.m., and from 6.45 p.m. to 7 p.m., all together 50 minutes a day. You can imagine what can happen to a woman who is in labor if that happens to her not according to the schedule that is put by the Israeli army. And as you know, women have labor usually at night. You can imagine what happens to a man with a heart attack and who cannot cross the gate because the heart attack happens not according to the schedule. Many people have died already because of this system. Many women were forced to give birth in front of the gates or the checkpoints. And one third of these 80 women have lost their babies because of that. This is how it looks when children go to school. They have to line behind the gate and wait for the Israeli soldier to come and open it for them. Sometimes the soldiers don't come on time and these poor students have to wait till the evening when the soldiers remember that they should open the gates for these kids to go back home. I was wondering, what would have been the world reaction if these children were Jewish children? And if the soldier was not an Israeli soldier, but any other soldier from anywhere in the world, wouldn't everybody be in arms calling to end this form of anti-Semitism? Well, it is also anti-Semitism here because we are also Semites, the Palestinians. Only it is an anti-Semitism practiced by Israeli soldiers against Palestinians. This is an image of a farm in a village called Falamia in the north. The upper part shows you how the farm was before the wall was built. And the lower part shows you what remained of the farm after it was completely bulldozed. This was a market in another village called Nazlet Isa. And this is what remained of the market after the wall was built. This is a house that was cut into two pieces so that the wall would be built. And this is how close the wall can be to people's houses. This is how an Israeli settlement looks like. And this is how a Palestinian village looks like in the same area. And this is how people suffer when they have to cross these terrible checkpoints from time to time. They can wait for hours. They would be indignified. They would be humiliated by the Israeli army. Sometimes they could be beaten. And they have to go through this suffering day after day because there is no other way. For 18 years, Palestinians have been negotiating with the Israelis. And the outcome was only more land confiscation, house demolitions, land appropriation, and the consolidation of an apartheid system. Since 2000, Israel has demolished 86,000 Palestinian houses. Since 2002, Israel has uprooted more than one million and a half trees, mainly olive trees, to build the wall. 
Since 1967, the Israeli army has arrested 650,000 Palestinians. Practically every second male adult in Palestine has been to jail. 19,000 people were arrested under the so-called administrative arrest order, which means that the Israeli army could put them in jail for any period of time they want without charges. This has been one of the longest suffering in human history. Today, Nael and Fakhri Barghouti, like Akram al Wahsh, are the three people who have spent the longest time in prison in modern history, for more than 31 years in jail, for no reason. The situation in Jerusalem resembles one of the worst forms of apartheid. Most of the Palestinians in West Bank, Gaza Strip, and in the diaspora are deprived from the right of visiting their city. But more than that, the 250,000 residents of East Jerusalem who were occupied in 1967 found themselves immediately after Israel's declaration of annexation of the city, temporary residents in their own city, in their own homes, where their families have lived for hundreds of years. Temporary residents mean that if they go out for education for five years or more, for instance, they would lose their right to live in their own city or their houses. If a man or a woman is married to a Palestinian in the West Bank, then they would not be able to live together as a family because the wife or the husband from the West Bank would never be granted the permit to live in East Jerusalem. And if the other spouse dares to leave and live with the wife or the husband in the West Bank, they will lose their residency permit in Jerusalem. This is the situation we live in. While if any Jewish person from New York or Siberia or anywhere else in the world decides to come to Israel, he would be granted citizenship immediately in the airport. And he can live not only inside Israel or Jerusalem, but anywhere he likes in the West Bank in one of the illegal Israeli settlements. The story of Gaza is another tragic story. This little tiny sector does not exceed 360 squared kilometers, which is about 140 squared miles. And it is inhabited by one and a half million Palestinians, which makes it one of the most densely populated areas in the world. Gaza Strip is like a big prison today. The Israeli government claims it has left Gaza and it has ended occupation to Gaza. This is absolutely not true. Occupation remains only in different forms. The Israeli army prevents any person from entering or leaving Gaza because they control all the land passages. The Israeli army surrounds Gaza from all directions. Fishermen cannot fish in the sea because if they go deeper than five miles, they would be shot by Israeli boats who control the shores and the sea around Gaza. The airspace is constantly occupied by Israeli airplanes, especially planes without pilots, who scan the sector around the clock, and from time to time they shoot one of their missiles to kill somebody. Gaza is still under occupation only maybe under a new form of occupation. We call it digital occupation, where Israel controls the situation by looking just at the screens and looking at the photos that are taken by their planes that scan the city. I'm sick.
In the beginning of 2009, Israel initiated one of the worst wars in the history of the Middle East. It was practically one-sided unilateral war. Israel used all the arsenal of its most sophisticated weapons against the civilian population of Gaza. Goldstone Report, who headed a United Nations Commission and who is well known to be one of the most decent judges in the world, Goldstone reported that war crimes have happened in Gaza by the Israeli army. War crimes that come close to crimes against humanity. Seven war crimes happened. Attacking civilians, killing civilians, depriving medical aid from reaching civilians, attacking and killing medical personnel and ambulances, the use of illegal weapons, as well as total destruction of infrastructure for no reason, and the total disproportionate use of force. The attack that started on the 27th of December 2008 ended up with the death and injury of many Palestinians. No less than 1,400 people were killed. 410 of them were children. Most of those who were killed were civilians. About 5,300 people were injured including 1,855 children and about 450 of them were seriously injured and many of them died later. Had we have the population of the United States in Gaza Strip, we would be talking about the death of no less than a quarter of a million people in less than three weeks. Had we have the same population of the United States in Gaza, we would be talking about the injury of almost one million people over that period of time. The Israelis claim that that war was an act of self-defense. But the results are very clear. While 1,400 Palestinians were killed, only 14 Israelis were killed during that war. Eleven of them were soldiers killed while they were attacking Gaza and three civil Israeli civilians were killed because of missiles shot by Gaza. Out of the 11 soldiers that were killed in the war, seven were killed by the fire of the same Israeli army, by friendly fire. But even if we exclude that, the ratio is very clear. 100 deaths for Palestinians in comparison to one death on Israeli side. I don't want anybody to die. I don't want any Israeli or Palestinian to die. But to claim that those who organize this aggression and those who have one of the most powerful armies in the world are the victims in this conflict is simply improper, unjust, and not truthful. The destruction that was caused by the Israeli army in Gaza is unbelievable. No less than 25,000 houses were destroyed. 5,000 houses were completely demolished. You can see in these photos whole neighborhoods that were smashed to earth. You can see houses that were destroyed, schools, hospitals, mosques. And when the Israeli army was leaving, they decided to destroy the last remaining 351 factories in Gaza. There was no justification for that. The army was leaving and there was no fighting. But on their way out, they 
managed to destroy all these factories that you can see in the pictures. The use of illegal weapons is another war crime that Israel has committed. That included white phosphorus, which was sprayed in wide areas, sprayed over schools where people were hiding. That white phosphorus can cause terrible burn, but also it can kill people if it is inhaled, and it can kill people if it goes into their systems by destroying the lungs, the kidneys, and the liver. Some people suffered terrible burns, like this woman, who had a burn of her hand and a burn of her foot because of the use of white phosphorus. This image of a child is very hard to look at. It's sad and painful and I apologize for showing you this photo. But please remember, when you look at it, how much this child suffered before he died. This is another child whose face was burned completely by white phosphorus. And these are the flechettes that came out of a new type of illegal weapon that Israel used during the war. Bombs that throw these small flashets that are sprayed in a very wide area with very small distance between one flashet and another. This is simply like dom dom bombs. Dom dom bullets are forbidden, illegal. They cannot be used in wars. These flashets represent something like dom dom bombs that the army is using. And this is an example of the effect they can create. We found discs in the wounds of some of the injured people. How did these discs end up there? We don't know. We know only that they were responsible for the amputation of the legs and hands of many people. So many Palestinians were left handicapped because of the amputation that was caused by Israeli bombs or bullets. Many suffocated under the destroyed houses, which was caused by Israeli bombing of wide civilian areas. As I said, more than 80% of the people who died during the last war in Gaza were civilians. This is the image of five sisters from Baalusha family. One was Jawahir, four years old. One was Dina, eight years old. One was Samar, 12 years old. One was Ikram, 14 years old. And one was Tahrir, 17 years old. All the five sisters were killed in one shot when a bomb hit their house in Gaza. You can imagine what happened to Samira, their mother, when she found out that she lost five of her daughters in one shot, in one hit. Similar stories exist. We know a story of another father who was caught under Israeli fire. His two sons were shot. He called for help, and the Israeli army did not allow ambulances to reach them for 24 hours. And he watched both of his sons die one after the other. Not a single house of the 25,000 houses that were demolished so far has been repaired. Because since the war, Israel is not allowing a single sack of cement 
or piece of glass to enter Gaza. And that's why these people remain outside their houses, homeless, without any ability, without any pressure from the world community to force Israel at least to allow construction material to enter Gaza. Schools were hit badly during these attacks. This is an image of one of the schools. And of course, school children were killed too. This is an image of one of the classrooms where you can see that these kids put the names of their friends who died during the attack. And you can imagine what kind of psychological effect and impact this has left on hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in Gaza Strip. Journalists were also attacked. No less than four of them were killed during the attack. Fadl Shana'a, a Palestinian journalist, was one of the victims of the flushed Israeli bombs. On the screen, you can see that while he was reporting the Israeli invasion, an Israeli tank detected him and fired a flashet bomb which killed him instantly. Carlo Handel was one of the journalists that were attacked by the Israeli army in the West Bank. You can see the shooting of his car. He was hit three times in the neck and he was so lucky that he survived the attack. That reminds me of a story of a very important journalist, Subhi Abu Zahra in the West Bank, who was hit during one of these attacks in Nablus. He was injured in the thigh and he called for an ambulance. And he knew he was bleeding and he could die. And in the photo you can see him and for 30 minutes, the Israeli army would not allow any person to approach him, would not allow an ambulance to approach him. And the man died in front of the cameras without accessibility to any health care, without accessibility to any medical care. The Israeli attacks included also destruction of projects. We used to joke in the past and say that American taxpayers' money in the form of airplanes destroy European taxpayers' money in the form of projects of infrastructure. Today we can say that American taxpayers' money in the form of F-16 jet fighters have also destroyed American taxpayers' money in the form of projects like the ones you can see in the photos. Because the Israeli planes did not distinguish between one house or another, one project or another. These people, Olmert, Livni, and Barak, were responsible for these attacks, were responsible for these war crimes. And it is time to tell Israel that they cannot be impunitive to international law and that they cannot be above international law anymore. The human rights violations that take place in Palestine are many. I would not be able to tell you in less than an hour all the examples of these human rights violations. But let me show you a couple of videos that may tell you the reality of daily life in the West Bank. The first video was taken by accident of how the Israeli army attacked a village called Ibidiyah near Bethlehem and started to search one of the houses. They claimed they were searching for a person who is wanted. And you will see how they start the search by shooting the place without thinking about any innocent people who could happen to be in the area or in the room of the house they are shooting. And then you will see how they use the dogs and what happens to an innocent woman who happened to be in the area when that dog attack.
These things happen around the clock in the West Bank. This tape was given to all TV stations. I gave it personally to many TV stations. Unfortunately, only one international TV, an Italian TV, showed it. The rest of the media did not. And that's why I think people all over the world are deprived of the knowledge, of the reality of what's going on. And I think people are entitled to knowing the truth. And this is another video which shows what happened to a young student who was going home after finishing his university. He was caught by the Israeli patrol with Israeli soldiers who interrogated him. We do not know what happened during the interrogation. The videotape we have, which I will show you now, includes footage that was taken by a neighbor who happened to have a camera and who was watching what was happening from his window. These soldiers did not know that somebody was taking photos of what they were doing. And what you see on this video is how the soldiers treated this young Palestinian after they finished interrogating him and when they were telling him to go home, which means they had nothing against him. And of course, he represented no threat to any of them. This kind of humiliation is what Palestinian citizens, women, men, children, young people are subjected to on daily basis by the Israeli army that is occupying the Palestinian territories. For 18 years since Madrid conference was held, Palestinians have been negotiating with the Israelis hoping to achieve peace and a state of their own on the basis of peace based on two-state solution. All we've got is more attacks, land appropriation, land confiscation, and the creation of the most severe, ugly apartheid system against Palestinians. The peace process has become a substitute to peace. In other words, the so-called peace process have become the cover for land annexation and the creation of Israeli facts on the ground that are destroying systematically the possibility for peace and two-state solution. Today, the Israeli different governments declare one after the other that they will not accept to negotiate the final status issues which were supposed to be negotiated and finalized by 1999 according to Oslo Agreement. The Israeli government say they would never accept to negotiate the status of Jerusalem, which they insist would remain unified Jewish city. They insist that they would not be ready to negotiate the situation of, the, of more than half of the Palestinians, the Palestinian refugees. They insist that they will not give back the Jordan Valley to be part of the Palestinian state. And they insist not to go back to 1967 borders. And they insist to keep the control of the whole airspace in West Bank and to keep all settlements which continue to expand. Then the simple question here is what is left then for negotiations? It is time for the world to see that without strong pressure on Israel, this course will not change. And this course is harmful to the Palestinians as well as to the Israelis. It is threatening the future of both Palestinians and Israelis. And by allowing Israel to be impunitive to international law, the world community is practically encouraging the destruction of the last chance for a true peace in this region. We, the Palestinians, have opted to conduct nonviolent resistance, nonviolent struggle against this injustice. We are calling, our movement is calling for nonviolent resistance. The Palestinian National Initiative has called for many years to take this form of struggle, and it is now supported by the vast majority of Palestinians. We demonstrate, we protest, we defy the Israeli measures. And you can see in this picture, 
Palestinians demonstrating with also internationals who came in solidarity with Palestinians and with Israeli peace activists that participate with us. Some areas like Ni'lin and Bil'in and other parts of the West Bank has become very well-known names of non-violent peaceful resistance against occupation. People go out and demonstrate every Friday. Even when they have a wedding, they go with the bride and groom to the site of the wall, protesting against the land appropriation and confiscation and demanding their rights. The Israeli army responds to peaceful nonviolent demonstrations with severe violence. They use tear gas bombs, they use canisters with dirty water, they use high velocity bullets, and they use the so-called rubber bullets. And many people die during these Israeli attacks on civilian nonviolent demonstrators. One of them was Ahmed Hassan Yusuf, a child who was only 10 years old when he was hit in the head by a high-velocity bullet which was shot by an Israeli soldier. He was one of five Palestinian civilians who were killed during non-violent demonstrations in Ni'lin. This is an X-ray of Ahmed Abu Hantash, who was hit in the head in Nablus during another demonstration with the so-called rubber bullets. These bullets can be very fatal, as you can see in this photo. Some of these bullets can penetrate the skull and hit the brain, causing immediate death. One of the victims of the Israeli army violence against the peaceful demonstrators in Bil'in and Ni'lin was Tristan Anderson, who is an American citizen who was demonstrating with Palestinians in solidarity. He was hit with a gas canister in his head, and he is in coma for many months in hospital because of the head injury that was caused by that gas canister. And this is another video that shows you how the Israeli soldiers treat nonviolent Palestinian demonstrators. This is a young man from Bil'in demonstrating in Ni'lin, and you can see him holding the flag. You will see what happened to him after the Israeli army arrested him. He was handcuffed, he was blindfolded, and while he was handcuffed and blindfolded, an Israeli officer made him stand holding his hand and ordered a soldier to shoot him from a distance of a few meters. This behavior, had this behavior happened in any other country in the world, not only the defense minister of that country, but also the prime minister of that country would have to resign. This happened here. This was reported. It was on TV. And up till now, nothing happened, neither to the soldiers, nor the officers, nor the Israeli defense minister, nor to any other responsible person in Israel. We believe in a strategy. We believe that the only strategy that would get us out of this mess is to combine nonviolent peaceful resistance with international solidarity with Palestinian people, including boycott, divestment, sanctions activities, like has happened in the case of the apartheid system in South Africa. Without international solidarity, Palestinian nonviolent struggle alone cannot succeed. We need to find a way of helping people survive the tough measures of occupation here on the ground. And definitely, we need to find a way of getting back our unity as Palestinians. This strategy that we believe in is based on four pillars of struggle. 
non-violent, peaceful resistance, international solidarity, and BDS campaign, Palestinian unity, and helping people steadfast and survive. People ask us, do you still believe in two-state solution or you don't? And I say, whether in two states or in one state, what we are asking for is our human rights, our dignity, our freedom and liberty. It is Israel that is having the choice. If they continue to destroy the potential of a two-state solution, we might be about to cross or have just crossed that critical point of irreversibility. Then the only option left would be one state with equal rights for everybody. But one thing I know very well, that we, the Palestinians, will never, ever accept to be slaves of occupation or apartheid. We will struggle for our freedom. We will struggle for liberty. We will struggle for our independence. We will struggle for the same rights that all the people of the world have already gotten. And we will never give up till we achieve that freedom. Nelson Mandela said once, when South African apartheid system was abolished, he said, we will never be completely free till Palestinians are also free. He also said that the most important human right issue of today is the issue of the liberty and freedom of Palestinians. Like Martin Luther King, like Gandhi, and like Nelson Mandela, we believe that our struggle eventually will succeed and we will overcome. And that will be a very happy day, not only for Palestinians, but also for Israel, who cannot be proud of creating the worst system of apartheid in the 21st century. It will be a very happy day for all the people of the world. The Palestinian National Initiative believes in Palestinian freedom, believes in nonviolence, believes in Palestinian democracy, and believes in international solidarity.